influence, tell your story. A part of this whole thing about having a sphere of influence is at some point, you've got to tell your story. The problem with most of you is you think your story is not a story at all. There's really nothing to say. There's nothing to do with that. And one of the reasons why is because you've never practiced it. You've never even been in a place where you've gone like, well, what is my story? You've never just stopped and thought it through. So I'm going to give you um, a story. By the way, many of you know this story, and I'm going to be jumping through um, a lot of it because I want to get to a specific part. This is Jesus uh, who is in Samaria. So watch this. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus wearied as he was from the journey. This is John 4, 6. Oh, I didn't do. Okay. Oh, jeez. That's what I needed my, okay, we get your Bibles in the air. Here we go. In Rose, do we believe it's the inspired word of God? If so, say amen. amen. All right, here we go. John 4, 6. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from journey, was sitting beside the well. It's about the sixth hour, which, by the way, means it's the heat of the day. Very important. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. We have a problem. There, first of all, he's speaking to a woman. As a rabbi, he wouldn't. He's speaking to a Samarian. As a rabbi, he wouldn't, specifically as a Jew. And he's speaking to a Samaritan woman. Boy, this is all sorts of a problem, all right? And he asked her for a drink. Now, she's in the heat of the day because her lifestyle has meant that the other women will have nothing to do with her. No one draws water in the heat of the day. All the women would get up early, go to the well, draw water, have time to talk with each other, gossip, be together, and then go back. But she's there by herself because the other women do not want to do anything with her. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? She knows the rules. She knows they don't play well nice together. She knows that the Jews hate the Samaritans and it has to do with all this history and it's racial and it's bad and it is as bad as you can imagine. And you have to understand, uh, as racial uh, tensions have been in our country, the issues that are here is that honestly, it is so high and she knows it. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Jumping down to verse 14, But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, what he says is, is that again, this whole thing about this well, but he goes, look, no, no, the water I give is different. The water that I give satisfies forever. The woman said to her, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And his point is, you're not getting it. You're thinking too literal. I'm thinking spiritual. I'm thinking of other things. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. Here it comes. Now, by the way, this seems very mean because he already knows the story, but he's trying to do something. And what's funny is, is that he's going to use her to accomplish something pretty significant. So he asked the most sensitive question to her, go call your husband. Go call your husband. Have him come out here. At this moment, it gets really awkward. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying you have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you said is true. He just exposed her story. He just exposed her story. Her story is husband after husband, man after man, and she's at the point that there's a guy that's willing to take her, will not marry her, but will be with her. But again, that's why she's at the well in the heat of the day by herself. And Jesus exposes her story. And let me tell you something. If you want your story exposed, let it be exposed by Jesus, who already knows your story. And I will tell you, some of you are trying to hide your story but I will tell you, you will never hide it from Jesus Christ. He already knows it. And here's the other thing. He already loves you. He already died for you to forgive you. And he already wants you to be restored. The last person on the face of the earth and in all of heaven, you should be worried about having your story exposed to is Jesus Christ. And the first thing you might need to do today is go home and just out loud tell Jesus your story. This is where I see myself. Because Jesus is going to say, yeah, you're right, and also this, and also this. And guess what? With my also's, I still love you. We got to keep going. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. I love that line. 
He just exposed her story, but she's been exposed before. She's heard ridicule before. It doesn't phase her. I think she, I think it does phase her, but she, what we call parries. Oh, I perceive you're a prophet. He just told you, you have five husbands and the man that you're with now is not your husband. I think he's a prophet. I think he knows the story. But she's trying to, to, to parry this off. Now, they go through this whole big exchange. Jesus understands she's trying to change the subject, trying to take it someplace else, trying not to focus on her, but he doesn't let her. And what happens is, is that the, the disciples come back, jump all the way down to verse 28. So the woman left her jar and went away into town and said to the people, who, by the way, when she starts talking to them, they're like, what? That woman is speaking to us? Listen, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Now, by the way, she has a pretty sordid past. So they're like, if he told you all that you ever did, we need to meet this guy. There's a story here. But here's what I want us to get to. She went because of her exchange with Jesus and said, it's now okay to say my story is out there because in telling her story, he also gave her hope. In telling her story, she got hope. And then she asked the question, can this be the Christ? How could he know my story? How could he tell me all the things that are there? And by the way, those town people are now listening. This whole thing that we're doing here this morning is about this. You need to tell your story. And you're like, Jeff, I haven't had five husbands yet. I don't have that kind of a story. Let me just say this. God doesn't need a five husband story to touch someone's life. What God needs is someone willing to tell their story. And when you go to someone in your sphere who knows you and loves you and goes, can I tell you my story and how Jesus redeemed me from my story? I will tell you it's better for them because you matter to them. You are important to them. So watch this. They went out of the town and were coming to him. This is where Jesus, by the way, says, look, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. That's what he says to disciples as they're coming from town. They want to know. They want to hear the truth. They want to get it. Are we willing to run into that harvest? Listen, verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me that um, uh, all that he did. They believe because of her testimony, her story. They hadn't even talked to Jesus yet. They're already believing because if a man can tell her story, there's something there. If Jesus can set us free, there's something there. And watch this, verse 40. So the Samaritans came to him. They asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. Now, not just of her story, they're hearing his story, and they're hearing what's going on, and now they're believing. And verse 42 they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said. I love this line. It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that it is indeed the savior of the world. Listen to me. Your job is to tell your story so that they come and hear about Jesus and they look at you and he goes, it's no longer because of your story that I love Jesus. I love Jesus because he has told me my story. Are you with me on that? That's what becomes powerful. So to set the example I've asked two people to come up and tell you their story because it is just this simple that you come and you tell your story. I want to ask up first Sammy Seeds. Sammy, come on up. Sammy, in about five minutes, because we have little ones in the room and there's only so long we can do this for, is going to tell you her story. And I want you to pay attention to the fact that what is happening is this is her story. And maybe her story touches you. And all I want her to do is tell you her story. And I want you to know the God that she's telling you about, she wants you to have your own story. Amen? Amen. Sammy Seeds, everybody. <laughs> Guys, just first off, like so excited to be here with you. And I feel like so humbled to be able to share with you what Jesus has done in my life so far. 
Um, so getting into it, I was raised with my mom, my dad, older brother, and younger sister. Um, my siblings and I were raised in the Catholic church, but it was more so the thing where we would go like once a year at Christmas time, and that was it. Like God did not have a place in my life, and I just wasn't interested in him. When I was growing up, the thing that was like, a big part of my life was that when my younger sister Maddie was born, she was born with congenital heart disease. Um, and when she was a baby, they did open heart surgery on her and it seemed to fix everything. Um, so growing up, we weren't super concerned about her. Um, when I got to my freshman year of high school, she got sick. Um, and we thought it was the flu and that it would come and go in a couple days. Um, three days after she got sick, she passed away. So what ended up happening was that she, it wasn't the flu, it was a super rare infection and her immune system just couldn't fight it off. Um, and for me, it was like one of those moments where I was like, what am I supposed to do now? Like, what is the point of all this? God, if you're real and you are who you say you are, like, why would you let this happen to me? Like, why would you take her away from me? And it just made me question everything. Um, and, like, looking back on those moments, like, I was just so, like, heartbroken and, like, upset and scared. And I felt so alone in that. Um, looking back on it now, though, like, I did have people in my life during that time who loved me so well through that. Um, and two in those people were my Aunt Bonnie and Uncle Kevin. So they had been going to church for as long as I could remember. Um, and they invited me to go with them in inroads to build houses in Mexico. And so I was like, okay, I'll go. Like, more so to get away from my life in Livermore for a week. I was not interested in a relationship with Jesus. I was not interested in going to church. I just wanted to get away from my problems for a week. So I went, and my heart just started to change. I met people who loved Jesus so much. I met Brett, and I met Jeff, and, like, those two guys in that week made the impression on me that, like, the way in which they loved me and treated me, like, I had never, like, felt that way before. Um, in the last day of the trip, we did a music service inside the house with the family, and that was, like, the first time I felt God. And for me, it was just, like, after feeling like the way I did after I lost my sister for so many months before, like even to like feel God for like a second, I was like, I like can't let go of that. <laughs> and so I came home and I started getting involved in church and started getting involved in youth group. And it didn't make it that like losing her was any easier, but like I knew that like I had something that I could trust in and I had something that I could hope in. And so I think like when people think about meeting Jesus, they think like you have to have all your ducks in a row and your life like has to be perfect. But I'm the living example that it doesn't. And when I met Jesus, I was in a place where I doubted him and I didn't want him. But I had people in my life who saw that pain and knew that the one person I needed was Jesus. And that, because of their invitation, I am standing in front of you here today. And I'm so thankful that they stepped out in faith because it made me love Jesus even more. So that's all I have for you guys this morning. <laughs> Good job, girl. Thanks. The next person I want to bring up um, to tell his story is Jason Manning. And um, uh, uh, he has been a part of this church, but his story and where he came from might connect with some of you. So if you guys would just give it up for Jason Manning, okay? Are you bringing a helper? Yeah. All right. Some of you know, oh, <laughs> I was like, this thing doesn't work. Um, so some of you know me, I've been around for a little while, um, and um, my story's a, a little bit different. I don't have a, two assistants, um, I don't have a, a, a five husband story, um, I have more like a five felony story. Um, you rewind about 15, 20 years, and um, I was the guy that uh, <laughs> you probably didn't want to know. Um, 
I was addicted to drugs. I was a full-blown alcoholic. Um, I was violent. I enjoyed fighting. I enjoyed, as I thought, taking care of people um, that were causing harm to other people, and I didn't realize what I was doing uh, to the families of those that were just lost. Um, hold on. Um, and uh, I, I met a girl um, at a party. Um, I wasn't supposed to go to that party. I was supposed to go to another party, but that one got broken up by the police about 7 o'clock at night. I said, well, we've got five or six hours to fill now. Let's go to the other party. Um, showed up, met a girl named Christina. Um, and uh, we, uh, we, we kind of hung out, and that kind of stuck. Um, that's my wife now. Um, <laughs> and basically, um, along the way, um, just watching her and what she uh, was going through, she, she went to a couple of conferences uh, and that kind of got her back uh, going to church. Um, step way even further back, I was actually raised Mormon. Um, that's a whole different conversation and not a five-minute conversation. But um, literally, uh, I had, I had um, kind of, uh, I'd given up on God. Um, I'd given up on God, and so I was just kind of <laughs> eat, drink, be married, do whatever you want. And because um, I figured once you die, you're worm food. Um, and so I was just going to enjoy or not enjoy uh, what was going to happen Monday through Sunday and start over, do it again. Um, I showed up after, after uh, class one day, um, and Christina was at a Bible study, actually, at another church around here, um, and I was going to be that guy. I was just done. I, was, I had one of those days where you show up, and you're like, okay, I'm going to disrupt as much of this Jesus stuff as I can, so um, I walked in, made as much noise, sat right in the front, right in front of the guy who was speaking, a guy named Jesse Inman, who was a guest speaker that night, and he was uh, speaking about how um, you can turn your back on God, but he's never, he's never going to turn his back on you. And um, talking about getting kicked in the teeth with, with truth. Um, and for the first time on my own, under my own desire, I prayed to God that night. And, uh, whew, get kicked in the teeth again when he answers you sometimes. Um, and so I was mad because <laughs> I got answers that I really didn't want. I wanted them, but I didn't want them, if that makes any sense. And... Um, and so I said, okay, okay, that was weird, one-off kind of a deal. Um, and uh, then my, my girlfriend at the time kept on bugging me and bugging me and bugging me. <laughs> and um, I'm going to say a word. It's not one of those words, but it's a double hockey stick word. And she kept on bothering me about going to check out this church that she went to with her friend. Um, and I said, if I go, will you shut the hell up? And she says, Yeah. So I show up, there's a guy in some khakis, and I thought it was going to be sort of, sort of respectful, so I wore khakis and a, and a polo, um, flip-flops, because that's what I do if I wear shoes. Um, and, uh, and there's this guy in the hallway, and he's dressed just like me. I'm like, sweet, I'm not alone. Somebody else is going to disrupt things. And um, I asked a couple of questions. The guy's like, well, why are you here? And I said, well, you know, I, th I thought the I was raised Mormon thing was going to put, you know, <laughs> give me some distance, like leave me alone kind of thing. And um, instead, he had answers to my questions that I never had uh, in the Mormon church. And I'm like, okay, I wasn't prepared for that. Um, and then uh, so service starts, and he went up and started to preach. And it was Jeff in the hallway, um, <laughs> ready to disrupt. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and I'm sitting there, okay. I just said these things are really deep uh, inside of me, deep-rooted issues. Um, and he had answers for him without, you know, with, without a half a step uh, in delay. And then he goes to preach about how, <sighs> how you could turn your back on God, but he'll never turn his back on you. And uh, for the second time, I prayed on my own. <laughs> for the second time, I got really mad because um, I assumed that my girlfriend had told him all the things I was going through. <laughs> <laughs> So I was mad at her, and I, and I didn't come back for three more months. I was mad, because um, I was like, that's, that's really rude. Um, <laughs> and I came back, um, I believe it was July 14, 2001, um, and for the third time I prayed, that I, ch I challenged God, all right, God, if you say who you, who you are, all right, take this on, you know, rebuild this. And um, I'm a work in progress. I got edges. I, I, I say bad words sometimes. And, but, um, but at the same time, I'm blessed to be able to raise these little 
guys and gals and another one. Um, and and, and, and um, God changes my direction every single day. Um, and I'm blessed to be part of this church because every single one of you guys are part of that. Every single one of you guys are a part of my kids' lives. And um, it's because of you and being that, that old school term of flavor of vanilla that uh, tastes right that day um, that really mattered. And uh, so I thank you guys for uh, letting me join you in this walk with Christ. Landon, 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 come here, Landon. You really wanted to do the microphone. What do you want to say? Well. <laughs> it's all he wanted. All right, so. You guys, thanks, Jason. Would you please? I still think I have those pants. Um, <laughs> two stories. Just two stories. Told from their heart. And many of you who are believers were already touched again. Amen? Imagine if you would tell your story to someone who's searching and hurting, the impact you could have. The impact you could have. And some of you go, Jeff, I have too messy of a story. No, you don't. Some of you guys, oh, I'm the most bland story. Can I tell you that I've had people come and say, the bland story that there's hope, <laughs> that I don't have to live the life I'm living, that there's another way, it's also a story. Do you understand what I'm saying? Wait a minute, you can actually live this way and not have all this junk in your life? And you thought, oh, I have a boring story, when the reality is they're, you're telling them exactly what they want. They want boring. <laughs> they're done with all the junk. Does that make sense? Never miss telling your story, specifically to your sphere. Does your sphere know your story? Does your sphere know what's going on? I'll tell this last story. Many of you guys know that I was at the ranch for many, years, uh, for many months. It was a place that works with kids. Um, the kid that will always be the closest to me is a young man by the name Mike Tippett. Mike Tippett uh, was, uh, came to us after brandishing a firearm. Um, he's the one I told you about, by the way, that went and to all the cops that had ever messed with him uh, and uh, um, asked for their forgiveness. You guys, if you guys remember that story, that's Mike Tippett. And uh, when he went home on his break, and so, and, and cops were blown away. Mike uh, and I had a very close relationship, and I, and I told Mike when I had to leave the ranch that I needed to hand him off to God because I wasn't going to be there, and I wasn't going to promise him I'd be for you every week, and we'll talk every week. I said, those things don't, but someone will be there. I went to my youth ministry, and, and um, uh, Jody and I were not uh, married yet. I, had a, I needed a week uh, off, and so I said, you know, I'm just going to go up to the ranch, and I'm just going to work. Uh, and I'm just going to just kind of just get out of my head and just work at the ranch and just be around people that are doing this kind of ministry. And so every day I was on work program, and then there's this whole new group of kids that I don't know. And they're like, who are you? And they're like, uh, I'm like, my name is Jeff Harris. And I'm like, I was actually Mike's uh, counselor. Oh, Mike. Mike doesn't do anything wrong. Mike's perfect. We don't like Mike. This guy's never done anything wrong in his life. We don't even know why he's here. And I'm going... Mike, come here. Tell them your story. And these kids' jaws drop. Because Mike told them his story about how his dad committed suicide on his 16th birthday in a church parking lot. And how he was so mad at God and wanted to cause as much pain to people as had been caused to him. How he got jumped into a gang what he had done because the gang members had told him to do it. And these kids who thought Mike was perfect because what had happened is Mike had been caught, and caught by God, all of a sudden saw a different Mike. And this is what they saw. I can be that. Mike left the ranch, went to the Marines, did amazing. Came back and was the ranch foreman for um, quite a few years. From a kid who I said, the first question I asked him, I said, what do you want to do with your life? Turn 21, drink until I'm dead. First sentence out of his mouth to me. Turn 21, drink until I'm dead. There's a story. Tell your story. Please, for the love you have for God, tell your story. I'm telling you, 
what you just heard, these two people, and I could have brought up more and more and more. Our stories matter, specifically in the hands of God. Amen? Amen. I'm going to bring our worship team up. I'm going to pray. We have one last song. And then I want to thank the kids. You guys did awesome. You guys did great. So glad. Your teachers got to take a break this morning. That is so good. All right. So glad. We have one last song, and then you get to just hang out. And if you want to help us break down, you can. You kids can lift these boxes. It's okay. You can do it. But thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for all the work of Sphere. And let me just say again to the staff that you have at Inroads, thank you from the bottom of my heart, all the work you did for the months leading up to it, all this week. And enjoy your one day off tomorrow. All right, so let me pray. Father, may we be people that tell our story because our story matters. And Father, it doesn't matter how we see our story. It matters how you use our story. Because the person who hears our story could say, that's exactly what I needed to hear. I thank you, and I love you, and I thank you that you love this church. And would you be with us, Father, as we move forward? Would you be with us as we talk about Sphere in the upcoming months and what that looks like for us? Because it's just that simple. I love you, and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.